Welcome to week 14 of our video series. Previously on administrative law, we looked closely at a problem case, Jerry's Ceramics. It gave us an opportunity to make use of the so-called canons of statutory construction and to look once again at the APA Section 553 exception for interpretive rules. We can take this away. An interpretive rule is derived from a textual source by a method for clarifying what it already means. A rule that explains a legislative rule by using a canon of construction is, so far, interpretive. A rule that imposes altogether new legal duties or adjusts a legislative rule in light of changed circumstances is, so far, legislative. We did not reach unanimity in our discussion, but a majority thought the Fourth Circuit should be affirmed in Jerry Ceramics. Although there was a potential ambiguity in the agency's small parts rule that could have been clarified by applying the rule of the last antecedent, the agency apparently had for years been treating fabric pieces and components as both excused from the use and abuse test. We don't know why the agency decided it had misunderstood and misapplied its own rule, but possibly it had become aware of infants choking on detached fabric components. It is a mystery why the agency did not avail itself of the good cause exception rather than the interpretive rule exception from notice and comment rulemaking. We now turn to a new topic, agency authority to adjudicate. We began the semester by studying the non-delegation doctrine, the constitutional limitation of Congress's power to delegate its legislative power to administrative agencies. Now we look at Congress's power under the Constitution to endow administrative agencies with the power to adjudicate disputes. The case of Commodity Futures Trading Commission versus Shore is our vehicle. The futures markets are volatile and easy to lose a bundle of money in quickly. Congress created the CFTC to bolster confidence in the futures markets by regulating them. In addition to rulemaking power, Congress gave the CFTC the power to adjudicate reparations claims by unhappy traders. The case begins with a complaint to the CFTC by one unhappy customer. Shore seeking reparations from his broker, Conti, for losses caused by Conti's allegedly illegal conduct. The statute, the Commodity Exchange Act, under which the CFTC operates, provided the reparations procedure to afford a quick and inexpensive alternative to going to court for disappointed customers. Conti was unhappy, too, because Shore had not paid him his brokerage fee. Conti had already sued Shore in U.S. District Court, invoking its diversity jurisdiction on an ordinary state law contract theory. The CFTC had adopted a regulation that allowed counterclaims by brokers to be adjudicated by the agency in the same reparations proceeding. Conti, the broker, voluntarily dismissed his suit in District Court and filed his counterclaim in the CFTC reparations proceeding. Things did not go Shore's way in the CFTC. The CFTC found for the broker Conti on both Shore's claim and on Conti's counterclaim against Shore. Shore was even more unhappy now and sought judicial review. The D.C. Circuit held that the Constitution did not permit the CFTC to adjudicate a common law counterclaim like Conti's suit for his broker's fee. The U.S. Supreme Court granted the CFTC's petition for review. The D.C. Circuit had tried to follow the Supreme Court's jurisprudence. Let's start with Article 3, which states, The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress shall from time to time ordain and establish. The judicial power is vested in courts. What kind of courts? Courts staffed by judges. 
The judges shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall receive compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuation in office. These judges have lifetime tenure, which is meant to make them independent of the executive and legislative branches. Article 1 offers officers and ALJs do not have this kind of independence. The commissioners of the CFTC do not hold their offices during good behavior, and Congress can cut their salaries. For this reason, officers and ALJ employees of administrative agencies are said to be Article I judges or Article I courts. But how can Congress do this? If it is hard to grasp how Congress can delegate the decision-making authority or rulemaking power that it unquestionably has, it is even harder to see how Congress can delegate judicial power, which Congress does not possess, to any person other than an Article III judge or, a body, or to a body that is not an Article III court. The D.C. Circuit thought the case turned on whether the agency was adjudicating private rights or public rights. The customer's right to reparations under the CEA is a public right because it is a right that was created by and tied to that statute. But the broker's counterclaim is a private right, one that exists at common law. So the D.C. Circuit set aside the agency's adjudication of the counterclaim. But the Supreme Court denied that the distinction between public rights and private rights was conclusive. Justice O'Connor wrote, There is no reason inherent in separation of powers principles to accord the state law character of a claim talismanic power in Article Three inquiries. Talismanic means magical. But that means there's no easy way of telling whether an Article I court can validly adjudicate a claim of private right. Article I courts, agencies, can adjudicate public rights, but as for private rights, a number of factors have to be weighed, and no one or group of them is decisive. The factors have to be extracted from the court's precedents. It seemed to be settled that public rights can be adjudicated by an agency acting as an Article I court. That was the lesson of Kroll versus Benson, which involved the challenge to an administrative award under a federal workers' compensation statute. Although it involved a dispute between private parties, the right was considered a public right because it existed only in virtue of congressional legislation. And then, in the Northern Pipeline case, the court struck down the recently revised Bankruptcy Act on constitutional grounds. An Article I court may not adjudicate a private law breach of contract claim brought by or on behalf of the bankrupt. That much was clear, but no rationale could command a majority of the justices. Then, in Thomas v. Union Carbide, the court held that an Article I court may adjudicate compensation owed a private party by another where the right is quasi-public and the parties have availed themselves of the benefits of a statutory registration scheme. Thomas involved the delightfully named Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, popularly known as FIFRA. Under FIFRA, Anyone wanting to sell an insecticide, a fungicide, or, or a rodenticide had to get a license. And to get a license, the would-be seller had to disclose what was in the stuff, and the disclosure was available to competitors. The formula was valuable intellectual property under state laws. These are private rights. But the would-be seller was entitled only to an award from competitors as determined by the agency after an arbitration. The court upheld FIFRA and the agency's power to adjudicate quasi-public rights. Northern Pipeline was distinguished on the ground that the Bankruptcy Act in its then form empowered bankruptcy judges, who are not Article III judges, to adjudicate the whole range of private rights claims by or against the bankrupt estate. Not even the availability of judicial review saved this scheme. But in Thomas, FIFRA was upheld because the private right was, in effect, quasi-public. 
the registrant exchanged its exclusive intellectual property in return for a license to market its poisons. Does Shore belong with Thomas or with Northern Pipeline? The court struggled. Justice O'Connor nailed it when she wrote, Our precedents in this area do not admit of easy synthesis. The Shore Court concluded that the factors in play more resembled those in Thomas than in Northern Pipeline. A subsequent case, Stern v. Marshall, revisits the general issue. As in Northern Pipeline, Stern v. Marshall had to do with the bankruptcy court's power to adjudicate a common law claim. In this case, a tort claim by Anna Nicole Smith against her late husband's son and heir. The Supreme Court held that Congress had no power to authorize a non-Article III tribunal to decide this private right case. Chief Justice Roberts' opinion for the court assigns decisive weight to the private law character of the right asserted, while at the same time acknowledging that there may be instances in which the distinction between public and private rights, as framed by some of our recent cases, fails to provide concrete guidance. The Chief Justice seems unsatisfied with Thomas and Shore when he adds, We do not express any view on how the doctrine might determine whether, for example, a particular agency can adjudicate legal issues under a substantive regulatory scheme. The idea of a quasi-public-private right, first recognized in Thomas and then in Shore, means that any synthesis is going to be uneasy. Where does that leave us? I suggest the following line of analysis. If Congress authorizes an agency to exercise adjudicative power and the agency does so, the question arises, may Congress authorize an Article I court to adjudicate this claim? The first step is to characterize the parties and the issue in dispute. Is a dispute between two private parties or is a dispute between a private party and the federal government or about a right created by the federal government? If it is a dispute between private parties about rights recognized at common law or deriving from state law, then it is a matter of private right, of the kind traditionally assigned to the judicial branch to resolve. In the court's words, any matter which, from its nature, is the subject of a suit at the common law or in equity or admiralty. Otherwise, it is a matter of public right. Include here disputes arising under federal statutes that require private parties to deal with other private parties in certain ways such as anti-discrimination statutes in employment and housing, or environmental or other statutes creating a private right of action, or the Longshoremen and Harbor Workers Act at issue in the 1932 case of Kroll v. Benson, which required private employers to pay workers' compensation. Article I courts may adjudicate public rights. We are not done we must next ask whether or not a given private right is closely connected with a federal statutory scheme. If the answer is yes, as in Thomas with FIFRA and in Shore with the Commodities Exchange Act, our final answer is yes. Congress may authorize a so-called legislative or Article I court to adjudicate claims. If the answer to the question is the private right closely intertwined is no, then our final answer is no. Congress may not assign an agency adjudicator. One caveat. The court in Shore acknowledged a valid separation of powers concern when it added, this is not to say, of course, that if Congress created a phalanx of non-Article III courts without any Article III supervision or control, the Shore Court rejected the dissent's worry that allowing agency adjudication was a step onto a slippery slope. The court distinguished specialized matters decided in FIFRA arbitrations and CEA broker-customer disputes from the open-ended jurisdiction Congress tried to give the bankruptcy courts, which ideally might be able to wrap up a whole slew of diverse private law claims by and against the party in bankruptcy. Convenience is not enough to guarantee constitutionality. Now, 
there is one final angle we need to consider. Under the Seventh Amendment, individuals have a right to a jury in a federal civil trial. In suits at common law, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved. The court has held that this right is not confined to cases involving what we call private rights. The Seventh Amendment right to a jury applies not only to common law forms of action, but also to certain causes of action created by congressional enactment. Actions by the government to recover civil penalties under statutory provisions are viewed as one type of action in debt requiring trial by jury. The Supreme Court has noticed a connection between the Article III issue, whether Congress can convey adjudicative power to an Article I court, and the Seventh Amendment issue, whether the right to a jury trial precludes an agency from having adjudicative jurisdiction. Luckily for us, the connection is a tight one. The question whether the Seventh Amendment permits Congress to assign adjudication to a tribunal that does not employ juries requires the same answer as the question whether Article III allows Congress to assign adjudication to a non-Article III tribunal. This simplifies life for us. Well, we should look again at our flowchart. Even in a public right matter, a party may have a personal right to an Article III judge and even a jury. Most obviously, this is true in criminal cases, but it is also true where the government seeks civil money damages. So we must ask, is a civil money penalty sought? If the answer is yes, a civil money penalty is sought, then our final answer is no. If a civil money penalty is not sought, then our final answer is yes. Congress may endow an Article I tribunal with subject matter jurisdiction. Not easy to synthesize? Amen to Justice O'Connor.